Yeah, welcome. Um, we're so glad you could join us today, this first day after Easter. So I'm sure it's um, it's a mood day where you are too. Um, anyway, we're so glad to have you. And today we're going to talk more about helping students with transitions. We thought this was a good time of year to do that as we think about kids transitioning to new grades or maybe on to college and career. Um, and just as things get a little crazier at our schools in the springtime. So um, again, hi, I'm Steph Lundgren and- And I'm Tammy Cheatham. Yeah, so um, yeah, we've um, been the ones leading you through paratrainings. I guess we decided for five years that we've been having these paratrainings and we always look forward to seeing all of you. So first we're gonna talk about um, a little bit about executive function. And we've talked to you about this a few times now, um, but it's the neurobiological process that lets us organize, prioritize, and analyze. Um, I might have everybody mute themselves until it's time to talk and then we can unmute. We're getting a little bit of feedback there. Okay, so again, it's that process that are in our brain that lets us organize, prioritize, and analyze. Um, that's what executive function is. And children with ADHD and related neurobiological problems have impaired executive function skills due to abnormal dopamine levels in the frontal lobe of their brain. Um, and it's not just ADHD kids that have executive dysfunction but 75% of kids with ADHD do um, tend to have uh, executive dysfunction. So um, that was kind of um, a hard to understand um, description possibly. So we have a little video here to watch and um, we'll talk about it. And then we're gonna break off and start to talk about that um, transitions, which um, involves some of our executive functions. Trouble with executive function isn't a diagnosis or a learning disability on its own. But when kids have a weakness in this area, it impacts learning and everyday life. The term executive function may not be familiar to some parents. It refers to a group of important mental skills that allow us to set goals and get things done. There are three main areas of executive function. Working memory, flexible thinking, and inhibitory control, which includes self-control. Working memory is the ability to keep information in mind so you can then put it to use. Flexible thinking is being able to see problems from multiple angles and find different ways to solve them. And self-control is the ability to stop before you respond on impulse, to control your attention and your behavior, and to manage your emotions. Kids who struggle with executive function often have trouble paying attention and focusing, organizing and planning, starting and completing tasks, and shifting focus from one task to another. It's important to know that executive function issues don't have much to do with intelligence. Kids with executive function issues can be just as smart as their peers who don't have these challenges. It's not clear exactly what causes executive function issues, but we're learning more all the time. Research using MRI shows that people who struggle with these skills have slower development in the parts of the brain that are responsible for executive function. There also seems to be a genetic component Many kids who struggle with executive function have a parent who also does. Things in the environment could also play a role, including high stress, poor nutrition and sleep, lack of exposure to language, and low quality of caregiving. Problems with executive function are closely tied to ADHD, but kids with ADHD aren't the only ones who have trouble with these skills. Many kids with learning issues also have weaknesses in executive skills that contribute to their challenges. For example, some kids with dyslexia have trouble with working memory. So even after they've become fluent readers, they might have problems with reading comprehension. They might have a hard time understanding a chapter they're reading because they can't remember what happened in the chapter before it. Executive function develops over time. So many kids find they have fewer challenges with it by the time they're young adults but these problems don't always disappear completely. The good news is that there are ways parents and teachers can help kids improve executive function and learn strategies for working around their challenges. Classroom accommodations like extended time and preferred seating can help. So can tutoring and organization skills. 
Research shows that even brief interventions, teaching kids how to pause and reflect before they respond, leads to improved executive function and actual changes in how the brain functions. And for kids with ADHD, treatment for that disorder can often reduce the symptoms caused by weak executive function skills. With the right supports, kids with executive function issues can do as well in school as their peers and have an easier time managing the tasks and activities of daily life. Okay, so that's a quick look at what executive function is. And one of the things that they mentioned was flexible thinking. There we go. So uh, working memory, flexible thinking, and inhibitory control are all parts of executive functioning skills. So today we're really gonna focus on that flexible thinking when we talk about transitioning. Um, so are kids able to think flexibly enough or you know, kind of bend in what they're doing, um, kind of being able to adapt from one thing to the other? Um, and that's, um, that's addressed in transitions. Okay, again, if we could all unmute, that will help. Okay. So uh, um, as we talk about transitions, um, again, it's that shifting focus from one activity to another. And I think we can all draw on experiences, right? We all have um, had probably students we've worked with who have trouble when we ask them to stop doing something and start doing something else. Would we agree? I can't see the faces right now to see if you're shaking your heads or not, but I think we can um, imagine, and especially if um, I can think about little kids too, who haven't developed that skill quite yet. Um, like if you think about a toddler and you ask them to put away one toy and do something else, um, or go, um, you know, uh, it's bath time. We have to put away the toy and go for bath time. And sometimes kids, you know, really have a hard time with those transitions, but it's not just for toddlers and it's not just little kids. Um, it shows itself differently from a tantrum, um, as kids get older. So one thing, I'm going to move my little control bar at the bottom so we can see, um, is staying positive. I think before we even start to talk about this, we have to talk about our teacher mindset. And staying positive will give students a model of how to be flexible and adapt to change and accept that change. Um, so if we say, ugh, we have to do this thing next, and I'm really not looking forward to it, and I bet you aren't either then it might drag the kid down, right? Or if we say, okay, um, you're going to middle school and I think middle school is awful and it was for me and it's probably gonna be for you, so just get through it. <laughs> that might not help them. But if we stay really positive and we say, oh my gosh, I know that you love math class and we've been doing math for a while, but it's time for us to go um, to music class. Um, and it, it'll be a nice change of pace. And, you know, I, well, here we go. Um, that keeps a positive tone to everything. Or if we use the middle school example, oh my gosh, it's you're starting middle school. Um, and middle school is full of brand new experiences and new friends to meet. And I can't wait for you to get to have this ex uh, experience in your life. Um, it's all, you know, like that voice that they hear from us becomes their inner voice. So we always have to portray that positively and, um, you know, have an excited tone for them. And I look at it as like setting the stage, you know, we're setting the stage for what's either coming next um, what's, what's going to happen, like I said, keeping it positive. I think setting that stage is important for these kids. Yep. Yep. All right. So we can think of lots of different transitions. Um, you can kind of think of those grade level transitions, uh, from preschool to kindergarten and then elementary school to middle. Um, I think especially that elementary to middle school, um, 
oh gosh, that's a, that's a big shift for them. They're going from having, you know, one classroom to be in most of the day to switching classes, having a locker, having to take lots of supplies with them, having many teachers in a day instead of mostly one teacher in a day. Um, I didn't say this back with the preschool, the kindergarten, but holy cow, I give those teachers a ton of credit um, for all that the teachers in Paris do to um, help kindergartners through that transition and help them learn rules and procedures. I think maybe now that our preschools are in with our um, public schools that um, that might ease that transition a little bit. Um, when kids switch from middle to high school, um, sometimes they're switching different teachers, depending on the size of the school, they might have the same teachers and it might not be a huge transition. Um, and then uh, from high school to college and career, we have to start getting them ready to be those independent, um, living on their own kind of kids. Um, are they ready for that? Are they, if they're going to college, are they um, disciplined enough to do their studies on their own and things like that. But then we have transitions that happen every day, like in the um, classroom when we go from one activity to another, that's a transition. Um, when we go from class to class, so for older kids, you know, the, when the bell rings and, you know, they are with another teacher for 45 minutes or whatever. Um, but also class to class um, for elementary might mean going um, to a special class like art or music or PE. Um, and that we see that a lot with that teacher to teacher um, transition. And with, with each teacher, you might have different ways of doing things, um, different rules or procedures. Um, many of our schools are now um, PBIS schools. And so they're really dedicated to making sure those transitions maybe aren't so hard on kids. And maybe there are some um, real consistencies from one classroom to another, but definitely just even the style of each teacher could be different. Um, and then right now, I think it's very timely to start talking about, you know, those transitions from being at home to being at school. Um, you know, the summer to school year, but now we have that school year to summer. Um, so a lot of structure in life during the school year and they're transitioning to summer where there's maybe more or less structure, uh, more time to pick what to do. Um, but some kids crave that structure and some kids crave the predictability of school. Uh, you know, I've definitely come across several kids in my career that aren't really happy when summer vacations rolling around. They like the adults that they see at school. They like seeing their friends, um, the consistency. And so that's a transition of mindset and activity and things like that for the summer. Okay, let's see here. So there are some research proven um, strategies uh, to guarantee success. One of them is school and family partnerships. So the more that schools can talk with families and families talk back with the schools and really view each other as partners and hey, we're all out there for um, the same goal and that's to make your student successful, your child successful. Um, the better off we are for um, students. And so um, when they view their teachers and their schools on the same team, that's a good thing. Um, you know, I, I guess I always tried to emphasize that with the parents from my classroom that I wasn't, I wasn't the bad guy, you know. Sometimes if I had bad news to deliver, um, it was out of concern because we're all here um, to make our students succeed, make sure that they succeed. Um, also, um, when um, students are part of pro, um, programs that promote academic and social emotional um, competence, that's when we can guarantee some, some success too. So um, we're not in it just about um, learning our, you know, our core subjects and the academics, but also kids need to learn about their emotions. And um, part of that is that flexible thinking and being able to transition. And the last is some continuity. So when we have continuity from grade level to grade level or 
classroom to classroom, that's when our students succeed most. So we think about all those important parts as we talk about transitions. So when we think about transitioning focus here, um, we really want to help students reduce the stress of transitions. So can anybody offer up what might be stressful in a transition? I'm going to let Tammy call on people because she can see them. I, let's see, maybe I can get pictures up here. Anybody want to share? Maybe I want to go first. What could be stressful about a transition? What do you think, Tammy? What do you think? I think sometimes the fear of uh, the unknown, you know, especially if they're going to a different building um, or a different teacher, I think they maybe not don't know the ex expectations and that can be very scary. I think so too. Like, um, I think just, yeah, at that new grade level or a new building. Oh my gosh, that's a little intimidating. I remember when I was a sixth grade student and I was going up to the middle school, high school and just thinking about, oh my gosh, I have to take my books around with me and I have all these new teachers and I heard that some were crabby and <laughs> you know, there's a lot to worry about. You, you've heard some things, but you're not sure. I think sometimes it's stressful to transition from one activity to another during school because maybe you've just gotten busy working on one activity or one job that you have. And then all of a sudden the teacher tells you you've got two minutes left and it's like, but I was so caught up in this. Um, what I, now I'm going to forget and I'm going to lose my place and I'm not going to be as successful with it. I think sometimes those kids that like if they want to keep going because they like completion if they can't complete it, you know, wanting to um, get that. Clear, yes. I guess I think that's, that's important too. And sometimes I think that um, transitions often um, involve some social time that can be desirable for some, but for some kids, they get stressed out. I don't always get along with my peers at school and now I've got to go be around them in the hallway or, oh gosh, it's recess time and that's super social. And I, I'm going to have to worry about who I'm going to play with or at that transition to lunchtime. Now I have to worry about who I'm going to sit by and what I'm going to talk about. And, oh, I'm worried because I don't like the lunch, the school lunch today. And <laughs> there could be all sorts of transitions there too. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about some visual steps for planning transitions where we can help um, take some of that stress away by letting them think through it and think about their reactions. And then we also, the end goal for all of our work with kids is that they're able to transfer those skills to different situations and environments. Okay, so, hey, you've learned that you get stressed out right before the bell's gonna ring. Um, what's a what's a way a strategy that we could use so that we don't get so stressed out and then maybe that happens at home too we could transfer that same um, strategy to home so maybe right before bedtime you get really stressed out because you're going to have to transition to bedtime what are some things that we're doing here at school that might also work there and when we teach kids to transfer their skills, what we're doing is teaching them those life skills that they can carry with them in any situation. And really, isn't that the goal? We're, we're trying to help them prepare to be really productive adults. All right, so this has kind of little prints. If you're like me, you might have to squint a little bit, but this is the biggest I could make it for this page. Um, these are some transition strategies to prevent tantrums. So when we're thinking this is more for our younger students, um, but I, you know, I want you to think if you work with older students, um, how this could bend or work a little bit with them too. I mean, I, I'm, I'm sure that they can. So one is to make it clear how much longer the activity will last. OK, so things like countdown timers are just huge for kids. Um, if a kid um, struggles with timing of anything, of taking too long or rushing through things, um, the power of a little timer from the dollar store or Walmart 
<laughs> just on their desk is huge. Um, there's also digital timers you can project up to like the projector in the classroom that can help all kids. Um, because I think, you know, those warnings give warnings like, hey, did you notice it's at two minutes? We've got two minutes left for this, or we have five minutes left, um, really helps kids. When we get into a frenzy, no, we got to put it away. We're late. We got to hurry up. Just shove it away and let's go, go, go. Um, that's when we kind of make them have a, a hurried sense and we induce some stress for our kids. Um, and then make sure that kids understand what's coming next. You know, okay, we're going to do this next, this activity next. Do you know what that means? And sometimes it's like really nice to have that agenda on the board um, with some pictures, even for the littler kids need pictures. Older kids just need to know what is coming next all day. I don't think any of us would like to be thrown into a situation where we only knew two minutes before the next activity what the next activity would be, right? We kind of, um, kind of schedule our day in our minds and that's nice to do. Um, number three is definitely geared towards littler kids, like to have some sort of transition object. So sometimes it's a toy or a little token or something like that, that they could bring with them. Number four is don't rush it. Um, you know, if kids have trouble with transitions, know that student enough to know hey, I better start transitioning earlier with them. Like the rest of the class might just need two minutes to, to transition, but this kid may, might need five or even a few more because this kid needs a break, which we're gonna talk about next, take a sensory break. Maybe they need to walk out to the water fountain and get a drink in between activities. Or maybe they need a little movement break where they go out to the hall and just walk up and down the hall one time or Sometimes there's all different sensory objects like cush balls and they just need to go out and pull on the cush ball for a little bit or feel some Velcro on the wall. Um, all right, so um, then we're gonna be prepared. So we're gonna, uh, structure and consistency are best for those kids. So you think about, is there a kid who has a hard time with transitions? Um, let's think about this. What if they do and um, at like one time in the morning, they get pulled for speech, right? To work with the speech teacher. And then they're coming back into this room for five minutes. And then we have to transition to PE. And then they're back for 20 minutes. And then they go to Title I, say, I don't know. I'm just making up the schedule. That's a lot of transitions in a little bit of time. So could we make speech butt up right to PE time? So it's one transition instead of back to the room and then back out again? Or how could we work that title time so it's a little bit closer to another activity so it's not so choppy for our day? So really be prepared, but that consistency is really nice and being organized and that the kids know what's coming next that we, we aren't really helter skelter with our days. And practice makes perfect. So um, we're gonna talk more about social stories and um, having some repeated practice in a little bit that can help young and old kids. And um, make wait time less frustrating. So for, especially for little kids, things like a song, um, uh, fidget toys, like they say there, movement breaks and timers can really help them. And um, they, they really do talk about using some things like songs, like, uh, for example, with little kids, they use the cleanup song. Um, and that just helps signal that it's a transition time. And that's what we always do when we hear our song. Um, again, practice the art of distraction. So, um, you can try songs or bubbles or movement activities that help them move from point A to point B. Maybe they're going to bounce a ball as they walk down the hall to a class, or maybe that's when they get to use their sensory object as they walk down the hall. Um, and then again, having a way to signal that the activity is over. So either that song, like a cleanup song or another way of signaling it. In my classroom, I had some um, wind chimes and I would just, um, you know, um, make them ring. 
and um, it was a nice, peaceful sound. It wasn't like a big, loud buzzer, <laughs> like the alarm clock or something. It wasn't like that. Um, so they'd like to hear that. So um, we'll talk about some other strategies here that we can use with kids of all ages. One is cue cards. Um, so it's kind of like a cheat sheet um, for the desired focus and attention. Um, and for older kids, it could be a checklist, you know, that they go through, hey, I need to transition to this class. These are the things I need to do. I need to write my planner. I need to gather my materials. I need to um, check in with the teacher before I leave. They're going to check and make sure I have my homework. Um, but cue cards can be for little kids, um, very picture based, right? So what does it look like when I'm transitioning from centers to um, be at my seat or something like that? Um, again, we talked a little bit about that countdown timer. Um, it really helps kids just kind of mentally prepare for what's coming next. Uh, so on Google, you can just do timer. You can just search timer in there and it'll come up. Um, there's some kind of fun, fun ones like timer bomb and then Kagan has some different timers. Um, oh gosh, anything from an hourglass to, I don't know, many others. And one other one is called triage. Um, so we did this at one of my schools and triage was basically, we were gonna get to that kid and help them through the situation before the situation became a problem. Um, so we were being very proactive rather than reactive. So kids meet with an adult to talk about a transition or other need that they might have before it happens. And um, so for instance, one of my students um, had autism and um, going to art class was really just hard for him. That was a hard transition. And so I started to meet with him before he would go in the room. Um, and fine motor skills were just one of his challenges. And so during art class, all the cutting and gluing and drawing, it just was, it was trying for him. So I would say, you know, um, before you go to art today, what are some things that you want to remember? And he said, um, uh, all I can do is my best work. And I'd say, yep, you want to do your best work and your best is always enough. And I'd say, and what happens if you start to get frustrated? And he'd say, well, I'm going to count to 10. And I said, and what if you get really frustrated and right on the edge? He'd say, well, I'm going to tell the art teacher that I need to go take a drink. So I'm going to walk out in the hallway and count up when I go. And I'm going to count back as I go back to the classroom. And, um, you know, we just talked through some of those situations and he seemed to do a lot better. And I didn't have him returning to class and things like that, wanting to be out of the art room. Um, so triage can really work. Um, and I think triage in that sense also um, when I um, taught kids like at the end of the year, especially kids who had behavior issues, I felt, um, you know, we struggled at the beginning of the year to find out what worked, right? What worked that was going to help them be more successful during the day. And when we could have them go and meet their new teacher, um, maybe at the end of the school year and start to form a bond, that really helped. So if they're going to work with a new para or a new teacher, they could go in and maybe have lunch together or um, help with a project or something like um, even um, at the like the week before school starts. Sometimes I'd have a student come up and join me and we'd put together a bulletin board or play a game or something like that, where it was just something kind of fun so that. We could talk a little bit, they could get to know me, see the classroom a little bit, so they could um, kind of start to prepare for a change um, and ease some of their fears. And we talked about practice before, but um, so again, um, it's visiting that school at a calm time or the classroom. And um, it, when I say calm time, I mean, Things aren't in a rush, like 
Um, I remember feeling like I was always running a marathon when I taught in the classroom. And, you know, there weren't at transition time, there wasn't a lot of time to like really think through all the steps and whatever. It was just like, go, 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 come on, time for lunch. We got to walk down the hall. No, you know, no dilly dallying. And um, it's nice for kids to come to a situation where they can just calmly think through it. So bring them in when it's not lunchtime, but we're gonna practice like it is lunchtime, right? What are the things we do? And we might need to run through that a few times if the student struggles. Um, uh, you know, it might even be, um, I think sometimes we use this as almost like a consequence to a behavior, but it doesn't have to be if we do it before, right? Or if we notice, hey, you know, I noticed you were struggling a little bit transitioning um, at our bathroom break time to being in the classroom. Let's just, I want you to just come over and for five minutes, we're just gonna practice that. You're not in trouble with this, but I just think that maybe we should think through our thoughts and our, in our um, behaviors um, when it's not time so that you can start to do that when it is bathroom break time. And for older kids, this can be done too. Like, hey, I noticed that the hallway was a rough transition for you today. Um, can we just, can we have a chat and just kind of discuss what kinds of things you could do during that time? Um, and then thinking ahead to high school, you know, like say oh, it's a middle school kid and they're gonna become a high school kid, have that talk with them. I think we just expect kids to know how to transition and do things and move on, but lots of kids struggle. And so that's when we need to slow down and help them through it, have those conversations. Um, ask them what things that they're anxious about and what things that they feel good about, what times that they'd like some help brainstorming about. And then there's those signals. So things like songs we've talked about and chimes. Um, some people have a xylophone in their room and they play the xylophone um, as a warning of like a two minute warning. And then, um, and for my class, sometimes that meant clean up. And then I'd play the, the chimes again at the end of the cleanup time. Um, some teachers have a nice clear signal like they switch the lights off you know, maybe for 10 seconds and then switch lights back on and that shows it's time to end our activity. And then again, those time warnings. And then repetition. So we're gonna use those same procedures regularly. Help our kids out by not switching things up all the time. If it does always switch on you and you don't know what the rule is now, that's where some anxiety might creep in. So we talked about um, some social stories or visual cues. So this is one here, smooth transitions, okay? So it's, it's talking about what does it look like when we're going to transition? And it gives all those picture clues along the way. So it says, sometimes transitions are hard because I need to stop what I'm doing. There's a stop sign. Sometimes transitions are hard because I get confused. I need to stay calm during transitions. So hopefully it would even have some ways to stay calm. My teacher will help me transition with many tools like a schedule, a timer, or a warning. And if I need help during a transition, I will raise my hand or I will get my para to take a break in the hallway with me. <laughs> I think lots of kids do that. So um, I think the picture clues are nice, especially for our younger kids. But for older kids, it can totally be done too. So I don't want to count this out. You know, for older kids, we might not call it a social story, but it's like, we're going to plan through what's, what's it look like at that transition. If you have a kid that gets in arguments in the hallway or um, doesn't get from place A to place B fast enough, they might need help. Okay, so I'm gonna challenge you to try one, okay? So to think for a couple minutes about a time that you notice a student or many students struggling with a transition. Maybe if you have a piece of paper in front of you, you could just jot it down on how you would help them create a story. 
think about some of those pictures. I'll move it back a screen just for a moment so you can see that one. Would anybody like to share something about um, a time that students struggle with transitions and what you might include on a social story? It's not right or wrong, just anybody has a yeah. situation that they want to share? I was thinking about the transition from a classroom to a lunchroom to recess and the voice level. So I might talk about in the classroom, our voices are small voices. In the lunchroom, our voices are medium voices. And outside, our voices could be loud voices if we want them to be. And um, kind of talk about that transition. And I might have um, like even, um, you know, like the little sign on all of our digital devices for how loud our speaker is. We might show that to the kids in those different places and show how they can transition their voice. I was thinking about when they get off the bus in the morning because that's kind of a definite, totally switching. Can you have the bus uh -huh. break, talk and speak and whatever and coming into the school, you know, and that could be set early on. Yes. For high school kids, I think even just the hallway to the classroom, hallway to the classroom is a big transition of knowing that when we can talk and things and when we have to be quieter. Um, and then there's a whole bunch of examples um, we could use in the classroom. So for we, we're thinking high school and stuff, if we talk about, um, you know, they're transitioning from taking notes and doing something whole class to now I have to do some independent work. And what does that look like? And how can I be productive and not just sit there and not do my work, right? Maybe that's a problem with some older kids. I don't know. <laughs> okay, we'll go on here. All right, so I'm watching my time and think we don't have a ton of time. We'll think about these problems here. There's a couple scenarios. Um, in elementary, a student is struggling transitioning back to the classroom after recess. How can we help her? And in secondary, a student is struggling transitioning from a hands-on industrial arts classroom to English class. How can we help him? Maybe everybody think, think of either one of those scenarios. Does anybody have something that they would tell the elementary student or that they could work on with the elementary student? They could, you could unmute yourself if you wanted to talk to the whole group. And if I had candy, I'd just toss it to you for doing that. <laughs> I'm sure maybe some of you work with students that you help transition back to the classroom from recess. Well, I always thought the bathroom break and drink break time were good transitions where they could start to wind down. They've been pretty amped up running all over the playground and now we get to wind down a little bit. And then my transition was always read aloud. Um, right after recess time, my kids came in and I did read aloud with them. And so they got to just calm down and refocus and that seemed to be a good time for them. 
How about a student who's struggling transitioning from hands-on industrial arts classroom to English class? Any ideas there? I think a little checklist for what, what's expected at class might be helpful for that student. And um, maybe even, um, you know, if they're taking notes or something, like what does that look like? Um, what does taking notes look like in English class? Or maybe they're reading a novel. And um, so just a quick rundown of what are we gonna pay attention to in this novel now? Um, and how are we gonna make sure that we remember what we read? you know, and just a quick little rundown through those. Okay, we have another scenario here. We have a student transitioning from elementary to middle school, and how can we help them prepare? And a student transitioning from middle school to high school, how could we help them prepare? So, my wonderful participants, I really hope that you could think about this for a couple minutes and then share out an idea. And when you're ready, you can just unmute and share away. <laughs> I guess here at Stewart, we have um, like our elementary kids, uh, when they go into junior high, we have like a day where they uh, go around with the high school, or, yeah, the high school kids or the junior high kids, I should say. And then they show them the classrooms, the teachers, which they of course already know, but it's easier for them to go into those rooms when they do get into junior high uh, knowing what to expect. The teachers tell them, you know, what they are supposed to be bringing to class every day and what is expected of them. And I think that that helps our kids here by doing that every year. And we always do that like at the end of the year. I love that, Sherry. Yep. That's such a good practice for them. Um, I taught in a building where um, I taught third grade and they were coming to our building new in third grade. And even just like practicing how to go to lunch and how to get a tray and know their lunch number and some things like that was just huge for them to come see it. All right, I noticed Madison unmuted, so they're ready to share something with us, right? Well, the elementary, since our school is so small and everything, we do the same thing too. As soon as um, our grades go from, from kindergarten to to fifth grade so when our fifth graders in a few weeks they'll be going up to the middle school to see how it is yep and maybe see their lockers see their right is. isn't that so, a big change just having a locker and yes, many yes, teachers their locker, their yes good i think those visit days are huge for a transition and just kind of ease their minds and get them excited too i think all right, so again, our goal through all of this is transfer. We want the kids to learn these skills so that if they're, if they're at um, softball practice in the summer and they have to transition from warm-ups to batting practice, I don't know, um, that they're able to use these same skills to you know, transfer over and make them um, successful there. But then not just as in childhood, but also throughout life. How can I help myself transition when I know that maybe that's something I'm not great at? What can I do to make it better? And I have a few resources here for you on the presentation, which is available at the PARA website, um, bit.ly slash pairs of ESU8. So you could access those later if you, later if you need to. And then Tammy's going to lead us through some fun stuff. And I'll just let you go through this slide, Steph, when I'm ready. So, you know, we've been talking all um, in each of our sessions about self-care. And, you know, it's really easy to say, yeah, I know what that is. I know how to do that. But it's another thing to actually put it into practice. So we're just bringing it to the forefront one more time about self-care for the spring and going into the summer. Um, one thing is just we 
put it together just about eight things. Fill your plate with spring greens. You know, get plenty of vegetables and get plenty of uh, greens. Um, celebrate a top 10 spring day. I think we had that this past weekend. Uh, um, Easter break was beautiful. I just. Those were my exact words. Top 10 day. <laughs> it was. So, you know, find one of those top 10 days and do something fun for yourself. Uh, meditate, contemplate, or spend time in quiet reflection. And again, you know, I'm not a big meditator, but I like quiet reflection. So I always go to sometimes find a place quiet. So I can just either read one of my favorite books or read a passage or um, read scripture. So I think there's lots of things that you can do to um, reflect on yourself and your situation. I get, no, I have to, I'm going to interrupt for a second. I have to say, I'm, I lean more towards that meditate side. Cause I, especially when I taught in the classroom in May, I would get so anxiety ridden of all the things that had to be done before the end of the school year that my right eye would start to twitch. And I knew as soon as my eye was twitching that I better write a, a list out, but also that meditating and just clearing my mind every day really helps me. Yes. Yeah. There's so many things we have to go to do. Uh, the other one is get growing. Maybe you like to plant a vegetable garden. Maybe you just like to tend flowers. Um, it doesn't, maybe you want to do a community garden. I know like a Norfolk has a community garden. I don't know if other small towns do, but. Um, Neely's planting one. Are they? So I think that's yeah. fantastic. I just think it's a way to bring people together, but also to get your mind busy and off of something else. Um, Ladies, I have a question. Yeah. What, what's the difference like between ADD and ADHD? Okay, so um, they're, they're both related. The H stands for hyperactivity. Mm -hmm. um, I, I was told in college that there is no difference, but um, I don't know if that's the truth or not. But I think sometimes we see those distracted kids as ADD. And maybe that's what we would um, refer to it as that kind of um, they're distracted and kind of daydreaming and kind of not attending. Yeah, you know, they're, they're maybe not so like all over the place hyper, but the ADHD brings in the hyperactivity. So they might be, you know, distracted, but also just fidgety and can't sit still and have to always constantly be moving or tapping a pencil. So your ADD is more your kids that are more, um, they, they might not be as active. They might not be the hyper. They're yeah. just more maybe... I don't know, not paying attention, more somber in the classroom. Uh-huh. Yes. Okay. I had a student that literally, when I was talking, I would be talking and teaching class and I'd see him looking down and he'd look up and go, you know, like he was, he was literally somewhere else. <laughs> yeah. That's a good question. Thank you for asking us that. Yes. <laughs> they get confusing sometimes, I think. Uh-huh. So along with self care is uh, opening a window and, and watering a plant or two. And I know that, you know, like even I, you know, we built a new house and they're saying that, you know, new houses are built so good that they have, um, they don't allow air circulation. I can tell that with our house, you know, we have south windows in our bedroom. So that's where more of the circulation goes. Yeah. Um, just open up, um, you know, a window and just make sure that let some fresh air in. I even loved also to always when it starts getting so nice, I wash our sheets, I hang them out. I love that smell of clean, fresh sheets from the clothesline. I love that. So bringing some of that outside air in um, and get outside and get moving. Doesn't mean you have to run, walk, ride a bike. Um, just like I said, just, just get some activity. I think that's good too. Um, it's nice to enjoy this weather. Spring clean your home or office or car. Uh, decluttering. I started doing that with my closet. Um, it seems like this time of year I've thrown things everywhere and oh my gosh, it gets to be such a, a pit. So um, it also makes you feel better too, just getting organized, um, knowing that you've accomplished something to, to go through that with spring cleaning. Um, set goals for the season. You know, I love the saying, a goal is a dream with a deadline. So, um, you know, it's just kind of nice now going into the summer, you know, what are some things that you want to have um, done or something that you've been dreaming about or taking that risk, uh, stepping out of your box. I think that's kind of nice to just kind of keep ourselves 
um, motivated to looking forward to something. I think that's really important as well. And I just put on here, I just created this little bingo self care. Um, you can do it at work, you know, if you put this on a, on a bulletin board or if you have it in, you know, with, uh, in a class, anytime you complete one of these, just sign your name. And once you get three in a row or up and down or diagonal, uh, maybe have a little prize. You can still do it till the, from the end of the year. Um, I think it's just kind of nice to have it in the, uh, the, the workroom um, somewhere. Like I said, challenge yourself or others. Um, not anything too, too tough, but just to remind you again, to take time for yourself. It's easy. We know it has to happen, but I'm, I'm as guilty as the next person. I don't always do it. So, um, and again, it gets us through till the end of the year. This might be fun to do with the other pairs in your building. You know, I'll do a bingo for self-care. And then once you get your bingo, celebrate together. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. Do we have any questions? Any other questions? Well, you know, Tammy and I are always here for you too, if you think of something later. And I just wanted to remind you to save the date that we'll be back. We hope to be in person this August and have a fun day with um, lots of fun activities, lots of great learning and a good lunch, right? I think Batman and, and Superman here are eating popsicles. Um, <laughs> we need that in the summertime. But our para training um, day at ESU 8 um, is going to be August 11th from 9 to 3. And um, we can't wait. And is Sherry, is Christy still on? Christy? We're going to bring back the postcards. You missed the yeah. postcard last time. I missed that. <laughs> <laughs> well, they will be here this time. And I hope you're here too. <laughs> It'll be a fun time. Fun day always with Paris. We admire you so much. So again, um, here are our emails. If you have any questions, please let us know. And I do have to say... That this is Tammy's last para training because she's flying on to other superhero duties next year. And so um, I don't know, you might be stuck with just plain old me. <laughs> well, you'll see me. I'm, I'm going to be working with Canvas. Um, you might have heard that that's a learning management system that some of your schools use. So I'll be doing more training with Canvas. So I'll still be working with ESU, but just ESU two takes on that project. So um, I might still be into their schools to see them. Yeah. Hey, that's pretty awesome. And I thank you, Tammy, for all of your help over the years. Well, and I, as I, you, <laughs> you're a great mentor. <laughs> well, Paris, um, we're at the end of our day and the end of the school year. And we admire you for all that you do. You work so hard and you're so dedicated and schools could not function without you there to you know, help behind the scenes on all, you know, picking up the pieces here and there. So um, thanks for what you do. Take care of yourselves at the end of the year here. And um, we'll plan to see you in August. I just want to tell you, ladies, you have done great. And we've really appreciated you doing what you've done for us. So Aww. welcome. Thank you. Thank you. You bet. All right. Have a good day. All right, guys. Take care. care. Thank you. Have a great day. Bye. Bye. You too. You too. Thank you. Thank you.